panel now, David Gazard, DPG advisory, former Liberal advisor, and Ben Oquist, executive director at the Australia Institute and former Greens advisor. Let's start with the energy crisis right now. AEMO, a- this market intervention, gentlemen, it is quite extraordinary, Ben. How did we get here? Oh, it's a total mess. Um, it's a complete market failure. But I put it this way, I mean, we were supposed to have a gas-fired recovery. I think we've got a gas-led catastrophe now. I mean, coal prices, gas prices, are, uh, because Australia is linked to the export um, market, are driving electricity prices to sky-high levels and producing an unreliable grid. So the idea that somehow we can't transition to renewables will have an unreliable grid, the problem is, think about it, we haven't transitioned to renewables fast enough. If we'd got onto renewables with a smart grid, modern rules, put money into storage, we wouldn't be dependent upon fossil fuels, which are proving unreliable and costing a fortune. Meanwhile, the gas companies are making off like bandits, paying no tax, no PRRT, hardly any royalties, largely foreign owned. It is a gas led catastrophe. D- David Gazard, what do you say to that? We, we, we have had this argument now for three years on this panel. But now it's coming home to roost. We're seeing Absolutely. the reality. We, we got more gas than Qatar. We should be sending it all over the world. In fact, we are. And have enough for domestic consumption. The argument really has been either go faster on renewables and now you're seeing it can't... The, the current ones we have can't bear it up, so maybe we could have gone much faster and put, put a, a tonne more in. Or you hasten slowly and make sure that you work through the transition, which is what the previous government was trying to do, and get there and, and get the new technology and build the renewables in. But you don't go into this position now where everyone's been saying, we've got to get here fast, we've got to... And, and the grid is now unstable and at risk, right? When, when we've had the resource to get there, we haven't been able to get it out of the ground. So what happens now? I think we're now in a situation where you're now seeing people that were saying we've got to go faster now saying actually we've got to recommission coal-fired power plants because we don't have the capacity to make the baseload. So you've been put under stress by a really, really cold snap where people are using more heat and we're, we're at risk of breaking down. Is that the reality? I don't we need to bring the coal plants back up to speed. Well, that's Madeleine King is saying. I, I don't think anybody Matt Keen could, is saying I don't that. think anybody could logically argue that the problem is that we've been transitioning too fast to renewables. We've had a decade of delay and, and, and it's now led to a disaster in our electricity market. We are going to decarbonise our grid, but the quicker we do it with storage, with a modern grid, with transmission, with um, market rules that are designed for the future, not the past, the quicker we get off fossil fuels, which we're now linked inexorably to the international market, the international spot price, and it makes us uh, beholden to those prices, to uh, shocks like the Ukraine, which means that we have an unaffordable electricity market. We've got the worst of all worlds. We've got fossil fuels that are polluting. We've got unreliable gas and coal. Not just unreliable coal, one of the the biggest gas-fired power stations in Queensland has been offline, and it's expensive. The only solution now is to get onto renewables faster and quicker with more storage, but we're nine years behind and we've got to get on with it. Well, I would say this, I mean, in, in answer to that, there are countries around the world that have done exactly what Ben has just recommended, who are turning back to buying coal-fired power across Europe from Poland. They are burning trees to make ge- electricity generation out of wood. So it's not like Australia's alone in this and there are places which have been far further down the track towards achieving renewables. Surely the glide path had to be done in a way where it didn't unsettle the stability of base load power. And you move out, there's new technology coming in. I, and I'm, we're, I think almost everyone's across the Rubicon, and Ben has been quite right on this point in terms of transitioning there. It's been the, the pathway and the speed to which we've got there that's left us in the position where we're in. Precarious in generation. Precarious is the word. Now the minimum wage increase... This was such a big part of their election campaign. We're going to hear from Peter Dutton shortly, their first uh, shadow cabinet in Perth today. But is this vindication for Anthony Albanese? First to you, David. Look, uh, short term, yes. Um, And I think, you know, if you look beneath this and, and both parties would have had the polling that says that 
people want to have a uh, uh, they want to have a short term pay rise, and who could say no? Um, the second is they don't quite trust their employer often to give it to them in terms of superannuation, so they want it up front. They don't necessarily trust businesses to give it to them in terms of super, and there's super going up to 12 or 12 and a half percent or whatever it is. So they they want the pay now, and they they or they would prefer it going into their super. But the last point is this, right? If you are paying more and you're a small business for your employees, the cost of the food, if it's a restaurant, the cost of whatever the services are, have to rise, and that further adds to the inflationary pressure and further adds to cost of living. I guess if you're ever going to do it and, and not risk unemployment, it's what's right now in terms of record low jobless rates. Well, I mean, I think I, I came from... Um the press club today where I saw Paul Erickson give a, a really interesting speech of what, what happened in the election campaign and he did point out that he thought that was a really critical point in the campaign actually when Albo backed in uh, a wage rise linked to at least inflation and all that's happened today is Fair Work Australia has kept the, the, the lowest paid workers in line with inflation um, and I think it's popular. Um, our, our Centre for Future Work had some exit polling out today showing that 83% of voters plus 79% of coalition voters back wages at least keeping up with inflation. We've had record profits, a record profit share of GDP, uh, but we haven't had record wage growth. We've had low wage growth. And remember, the, the, this increase in the minimum wage covers off an effective real cut in minimum wages over 2.5% over the last year. So they really had no choice. I think... The, I, I think, guess in the context as well of rates on, on a steady climb now to... For, to assist people grapple with that, it's not going to be easy. Well, at, at, I think I think economically it's important to note that inflation is not being solely driven driven by the increase on the demand side. It's being driven by uh, supply crunches, so mm. skill shortages, Ukraine, um, difficulty of getting uh, goods and services in, at least in part. So in that way, uh, a rise in wages is not going to be uh, necessarily inflationary. The um, and I mean to that point, the the. Ben's absolutely right. When you have a, a constrained market for labour, the price rises, right? That's simple yeah. supply and demand. And there is a way through this because no one is going to resent low paid people getting, being able to afford things no. and, and, and keeping up. But if inflation keeps rising, it's hard to keep going up that, that, that stairway, right? Yeah. And on that ladder, because that will add to inflationary pressures. But the other side of this is if you can do more, in your workplace, in a productive sense, you can actually keep up, and that's the big. That's the probably the goal. The, the big lesson, though, is that wage rises don't rise automatically, even with low unemployment. We needed more government no. inter intervention. We need more bargaining power for workers. We need the Fair Work Commission to increase minimum wages rise. We need the government to stop the wage cap on um, public servants. Unless there's some direct government intervention, wages won't rise automatically. That's the, that's the lesson of the modern economy. The, uh, the Cabinet meets today in Gladstone. The Shadow Cabinet met in Perth. Both sides go into areas where they could do have done a lot better. Certainly uh, Labor had some swings to them in Queensland, but no seats. <clears throat> WA. A loss of a seat. The loss of a seat, exactly, in Griffith. And then you look to WA, it was a complete debacle for yeah. the Liberal Party. Yeah, I think that basically says, you know, I think Labor has five seats out of 26 in Queensland and certainly the Liberal Party got wiped out in, in, in WA. It's probably saying, hey, we, we, we get the message, right? We're, we're listening and first stop on, the, on the, uh, the, the tour is back in your state. And there are these are pictures of that regional shadow cabinet me meeting in the seat of Flynn and, and Anthony Albanese confirming that the local mayor, uh, Burnett, will be running again for them. So optimistic that they might be able to pick it up next time he's campaigning, he's sort of turning well, his attention already to the next Well, election. they've got upside in Queensland, but let's, let's look at it this way. The election campaign didn't work out as planned for either side. Labor said at the start of the campaign they were going to come to victory through a swag of seats in Queensland. And the coalition said they were going to defend it by holding seats in New South Wales. Now, neither of those things happened. Mm. Um, and, and the electoral math come 2025 will be different again to what we think it is there. You just can't repeat the lessons from the last election and hope to win the next one. It'll be very different. Totally right. Yep, indeed. Yeah. Very uh, interesting result, no doubt about that. And tonight, gentlemen, I appreciate that, Ben and, and David. We'll see you next week.